After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may please be seated. <clears throat> Sisters and brothers in Christ, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and you are most certainly our Redeemer. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, in ancient Judaism, the temple was everything. The temple was the focal point of religious life. Indeed, ancient Jews from all over the nation of Israel would make periodic pilgrimages to to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. Particularly at the time of Passover, families made the trek to Jerusalem, changing Roman coins to Jewish coins, purchasing a lamb, and celebrating Passover with many of the other families gathered there in Jerusalem, each with their own lamb to celebrate. It was in this respect maybe like our Thanksgiving holiday, only they were using lambs and we used turkeys. Besides being, though, the focal point of religious life, the temple was understood to be the residence of God here on earth among God's people. The temple was God's house. Sure, God's glory fills all of creation, both heaven and earth, but for the people of Israel, the temple was God's specific abode with them. Furthermore, the temple served as the place where the treasury of the state was housed. The wealth of the Jewish king and his kingdom was stored in the temple. The temple was the depository of the king's treasure because it was considered the safest place to store the treasures, very much like a bank. The temple was considered inviolable since it was where God's presence abided. So, of course, the king kept the nation's treasures there. Interestingly enough, the ancient Jewish people also considered the temple of Jerusalem to be the highest place on earth. It isn't, of course, but that is how the Jewish people understood the geography of Jerusalem. So in the Bible, whenever the Jewish people are traveling to the temple in Jerusalem, no matter what direction they are coming, they are said to be going up to the temple. And likewise, as the people left Jerusalem, whatever direction they were heading, it was still considered going down from the temple. We do a similar thing in our modern day, except for us is dependent on the direction. If we're traveling north, we might say we are going up to Maine this summer, for instance, or if we're traveling south, we might say we're going down to Florida. So yes, the temple was everything to the Jewish people. And over Jewish history, the temple went through several iterations. First temple was built by King Solomon in 10th century BC. It was known appropriately enough as Solomon's temple. This temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in the 6th century BC. The Babylonians conquered the southern part of of Israel known as Judah. The Babylonians destroyed then Jerusalem and the temple and exiled many of the Jewish inhabitants to Babylon. But then less than a century later, at the end of the 6th century BC, the Jewish people returned from exile and they rebuilt the temple. This then was the second iteration of the temple and it is sometimes referred to as Zerubbabel's temple because he was the chief political officer there at the time of the restoration of the temple. However, this temple was subsequently desecrated by the Greeks in 325 BC and by the Romans then in 63 BC. It was then Herod the Great who was responsible for restoring the temple yet again. Herod though went well beyond just refurbishing and repairing the temple. He covered the entire temple in gold and built an enormous platform around the temple. And it is this iteration of the temple, Herod's temple, with which Jesus would have been familiar. And it is this temple, Herod's temple, that would be destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, AD, never then to be built again. Now it seems, at least according to the Gospels, that Jesus predicted the destruction of Herod's temple. We even have some semblance of Jesus' prediction today of the destruction here in our gospel reading. Jesus says, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. A similar declaration appears in Matthew and Mark's gospels. John is the only gospel, however, that clarifies that Jesus is speaking about his body, even though that is the assumption in Matthew and Mark as well. 
And it is quite interesting that these Gospels make this leap from the temple that was made of stone to the temple that now is Christ's body. So what is going on here, we wonder? Why begin to speak of the temple as Christ's body? Well, it begins to make sense to us when we realize that all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written after the destruction of Herod's temple in 70 AD. And the question no doubt arose among our ancient ancestors, what now? If the temple was everything, what do God's people do now, now that the temple is no more? And for some Jewish groups like the Sadducees, whose identity as a group was completely wrapped up in the temple, well, they disappeared. No temple, no Sadducees. For other Jewish groups like the Pharisees, the synagogue takes precedent after the destruction of the temple. The synagogues were strewn throughout Israel and beyond and served as gathering places for devout Jews to study God's law. But for the early Jewish Christians, and specifically for the gospel writers, the answer to the question, what do we do now, now that the temple is no more, for the early Jewish Christians, the answer was Jesus. Jesus was the new temple. Now, we don't know if Jesus actually himself said, to destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. After all, Jesus was crucified 40 years before the destruction of the temple. We don't know then if these are Jesus' actual words or a literary invention by the gospel writers who were trying to give some spiritual guidance to the people who were wondering how they are to conduct their religious lives with no temple to speak of. Not that this much matters, whether these are Jesus' words or a literary invention that came later. But here is the thing, and this is really what is most important. The temple was the symbol of God's presence here on earth with God's people, right? But the temple was also symbolic of the people's service towards God. For this is what the priestly system and the ritual sacrifice was all about, the people serving God at the temple. You see, the ancient Jews believed that God needed to be fed, and the slaughtering of animals and the subsequent burning of those animals on the altar at the temple was the way that God was fed by the people. The altar, you see, was a transport station. The animal carcass was burned up, the carcass decreased in size, and the smoke was carried up to heaven up to God makes sense in terms of what the ancient Jews observed happening there on the altar. And so God received, by way of the altar, that transport uh, station, God received God's share of the food, and the people themselves then also enjoyed a nice barbecue as well with what remained of the burnt-up animal carcass. But first and foremost, the sacrifice, the ritual of that, was for the purpose of feeding God and also the taking care of God's house, the temple, seeing to the incense being burned in the temple, and that the candles were lit in the temple, etc., and so forth. All this was the role of the priests, again, for the purpose of serving God. The priests in this way were almost like house servants. So here we have God's people serving God almost as if God can't do for God's self. But then the script is flipped, as they say, when the Christians begin to speak of Jesus as the new temple. Suddenly, it is not about God's people needing to serve God as much as it is about Christ serving us. And Jesus himself says as much in, in the scriptures, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. The script is flipped. Now, truth be told, the ancient Jewish faith was already beginning to rethink the priestly system and the ritual of sacrifice well before the first Christians entered the scene. The prophet Hosea, in chapter 6, verse 6, for instance, proclaims the word of the Lord, saying, and this is God speaking, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. And again, the psalmist in Psalm 51, verse 16, writes, speaking to God, For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. So the ancient Jews were already rethinking the temple sacrifice before Jesus appeared on the scene. But what is the point? 
What is the message that we are to take with us by the idea that Jesus now is the new temple? Well, I think it's just this. That sometimes the greatest gift we can give to someone else is to allow them to give to us. Let me say that again. Sometimes the greatest gift that we can give to someone else, even to God, is to allow them to give to us. Now, this is true, of course, in our human relationships. Sometimes we should allow others to give to us, even though that is difficult to do. We don't necessarily like the idea of being catered to. We like to do for ourselves. We don't like to feel dependent. And we like to feel useful, which is probably why the ancient Jews felt the need to serve God. But there is great spiritual growth in just being open to receiving the goodness of God. It teaches us, really, what grace is. I often think that this is really what the season of Lent is all about, recognizing that as much as we might think that we can do for ourselves, that we can heal ourselves of sin, that we have some grandiose part to play like the ancient priests, ultimately, we have to let go and let God, as the saying goes. Therein we find grace. Let go let God. And again, it is difficult to come to that revelation, but there it is. That is grace. And this, no doubt, is what the early Jewish Christians discovered when Jesus said that he is the new temple, that unlike the sacrifice humans had made for God over and over again on the altar, Jesus is now the sacrifice made for us, the sacrifice made for us on the cross. And so we receive this grace in Lent at the cross, and we receive this grace every day when we simply allow God to serve us. And in this way, we are giving then the greatest gift we can give to God simply by acknowledging that grace towards us. Yes, sometimes the best gift we can give to another is to allow them to give to us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. We'll sing together then our hymn of the day. Please note that it is not uh, printed in your bulletins. You'll have to use the red hymnal, and it's hymn number 757.
Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and all a world in need. You alone are God. We thank you for the gift of Sabbath rest. Awaken the church to the mystery of your presence and give us glad hearts as we receive the good news of deliverance. Hear us, O God. Your mercy mercy is great. You renew creation. Drive out those who would make the earth a marketplace. Protect rainforests, mountaintops, oceans, and wilderness areas from commercial exploitation. Unite nations, policymakers, and businesses in efforts to reduce carbon emissions. Hear us, O God, your mercy mercy is is great. great. You judge the nations. We pray for an end to war and strife in every land. Strengthen international efforts to negotiate peace and provide humanitarian aid to people fleeing from conflict. Hear us, O God, your Your mercy mercy is great. great. You bring healing and hope. We give thanks for physicians, nurses, researchers, therapists, and public health workers who prevent and treat illness. We pray for any who are sick. Hear us, O God. Your Your mercy mercy is great. great. You abide with your people. Sustain any in this community undergoing life transitions, marriage, divorce, childbirth, adoption, moving, graduation, employment change, or a death in the family. We pray for those preparing for baptism. Hear us, O God. Your Your mercy mercy is great. great. You bring life from death. We remember our loved ones who have died, confident that they will have new life in you. May we trust that nothing can separate us from your love. Hear us, O God. Your Your mercy mercy is great. great. Are there other prayer requests from the people of God? Hear us, O God. Your Your mercy mercy is great. great. You comfort the afflicted. Graciously help those in need, especially these persons, Cindy and John Evans and their family at the time of the loss of their child. Pastor Jody Ellis, Sharon Lamp, Jean Gross, Tom Burson, Dave McClawson, Betty Windemaker, Stephen Michael Lee, Kent Clellan, Ethel Petrusky, and all those family and friends whom our church holds in prayer. We pray for an end to war in this world, especially in the Ukraine and the Middle East. We pray for Bishop Dunlop and for our synod. We pray for the United Lutheran Seminary and we pray for our sisters and brothers at Our Savior Lutheran Church as they pray for us. Hear us, O God. Your Your mercy mercy is great. great. You watch over your people. Strengthen our military men and women that they may be vigilant in their service. We pray especially for our family members and friends serving in the military such that as they serve to protect our nation, may they be reminded of your constant protection. Hear us, O God. Your Your mercy mercy is great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And And also also with you. Let us share a sign of that peace with one another. And we invite those that are on video to share, uh, turn on the video that we might share the peace with you. God's peace be with you. God's peace, Jadon. God's peace, thank you. God's peace. It's Tom, Tom and Kathy, and Kent. Yeah, down the bottom.
in the right. He's it's not really a spic him. Oh, there he is. The mayor's hat today. As we make our way back to our pews, just a reminder that there are a number of ways by which you may contribute your offering to uh, St. Stephen's. Those are noted on the back of your bulletin. Thank you. Let us pray. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered that all people may know your goodness. And feed us now, feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. I invite those that are using uh, the communion packets as well as that are in Zoom to prepare your elements for communion. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you, O God, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures from age to age. 
Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea. Praise to you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. Praise to you for your spirit poured out on all nations. In the night in which he is betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ Christ has died. died. Christ Christ is is risen. Christ Christ will will come come again. again. O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Come, Come, Holy Holy Spirit. Spirit. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us forth, burning with justice, peace, and love. Come, Come, Holy Holy Spirit. Spirit. With your holy ones of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God, blessed and holy Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Bread for the journey, a feast for hungry hearts. Come and eat.
those that are on Zoom and using the communion packets, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given and shed for you. Amen. And just a reminder to please dispose of any remaining communion elements directly back to the earth. Thank you. And if you would please stand, the congregation. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat are gathered into one bread, now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Amen. And we now have the sending of communion to the sick and homebound. Gracious God, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, assist us in this ministry on which we are sent forth. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those to whom we bring this sacrament, that through the body and blood of your Son we may all know the comfort of your abiding presence. Amen. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn, then, is in the cross of Christ thy glory. Sisters and brothers in Christ, go in peace, serve in love. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We, we will. will.